Shannon, thank you for the, uh, for the kind introduction. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Erasmus Medical Center where we are virtual, but live today. Yes. Uh, yeah. My name is Joost Damen, an interventional cardiologist focused on uh, cardiac intra intravascular imaging and uh, physiology here in the uh, Erasmus Thorax Center. And uh, I'm here with my co-host of today, uh, Mr. Jurgen Lichthardt, who is our uh, friend and good colleague uh, and an uh, IVUS expert since, uh, since day one of the introduction of IVUS many years ago. So it's a pleasure to host yep. this, uh, this meeting with him today. Um, so the title of the symposium today is uh, Imaging with the uh, Assist HDI uh, Imaging Console, um, a course that will be very basic and practical. So maybe if you can switch to the, uh, to the slides that we've prepared for today. So this will be, as mentioned, a virtual event uh, focused on the basics of IFIS image interpretation and uh, procedural yep. guidance. Uh, we'll do that in introduce, introducing to you a step-by-step uh, -step IVIS-guided PCI guide uh, with the ASSIST uh, HDI system uh, together with the Kodama catheter. So the good thing is that we have the, uh, the original ASSIST uh, software on a tablet here available for you to, uh, to guide you live, live throughout the, uh, the software. And we will then uh, help you to get acquainted with the basic principles of the, uh, of the software of IVIS, uh, some basics and recognizing different types of plug, procedural panning and uh, post-PCI optimization. So we'll do that based on, uh, on a very short introduction of, of some of the basics of uh, practical usage of IVIS. And then we'll take you through a case that, yep. uh, that we've prepared for you uh, in which we used IVIS both in a pre, per and post-procedural setting in order to, uh, to bring you up to speed to some of the basics of, uh, of the use of IVIS in the context, in this case, of, uh, of a STEMI case. So I, as again, the course is uh, very practically oriented and we will uh, at some points also open up the floor for, uh, for discussion. So really we would urge you to, uh, to use the Q&A function here in the, uh, in the Zoom function to, yeah. uh, to get in contact yeah. and to take the opportunity to ask any questions you might have uh, live during the presentation. So for the basic principles, I'm going to turn the word to, uh, to Jürgen. Yeah, yeah yo, thank you very much. And um, uh, I'm going uh, uh, back with you a little bit to the history of the first um, uh, Ivises and um, what we uh, have now, what, what happened before we went to the 60 megahertz uh, broadband. Um, well, what is um, still um, available, that's uh, 20 megahertz, what you can see at the left uh, screen. Uh, the 30 megahertz, that's actually the first one that uh, was introduced in uh, 1989, uh, that's in the middle, and the 40 megahertz that came later in the early 90s. And the difference what you see here, that um, uh, what you need to realize is the higher the frequency, the higher the resolution, uh, the smaller the details that you can see. And uh, you can appreciate that, uh, for instance, by 20 megahertz, where we see, uh, for instance, the lumen as a black, uh, as a black, well, hole like that. So that is uh, in one uh, part easy. Uh, that you can see uh, clearly the lumen as black, and a lot of people uh, like it like that. With the 30 megahertz, you see already due to the higher resolution, and uh, I'm sorry that I do not have these pictures moving, that you can already see some blood, blood speckling. speckling there. And, um, and with the 40 megahertz, you, can, uh, you see that the blood speckling is there, but you see a sort of finer grain there. Um, what is also obvious, and maybe you can appreciate it a little bit on this uh, picture, that um, uh, you always pay something. Hey, with, uh, if you have a lower resolution, you can see, uh, you can see further. Hey, like with 20 megahertz, you can see in bigger vessels and you can see more of the surroundings. And already with a 40, you can see already that outside that um, the uh, picture gets darker there. So that means the higher the resolution, hey, the higher the frequency, the less you see from the outside. Well, and then uh, what happens then? What, how, how about 60? Well, 60, if we go to 60 like this one, this is a picture with the 60 megahertz, and there you see that uh, it's not that, uh, uh, that bad. You would uh, expect that you won't see anything outside the vessel, 
but because of um, a broadband that uh, you do not see only 60 megahertz uh, particles but also for the fire field what we see uh, there we get the information with 40 megahertz that uh, 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 even with 60 that we see in the near field smaller uh, details we see still enough from the surroundings so that we can see the whole picture of uh, the ivers like we see in this uh, normal vessel and uh, this is 60 if you can compare that with the 40 and, and I want to put your attention then on the outside of the vessel and that for instance the media, uh, the media normally is a darker line, a small dark line and that is very obvious visible in this picture with the, in a normal vessel. If you look at the 40 megahertz uh, then this darker line is not that sharp. We see it, but it's uh, not that sharp and not so obvious like we see in the 60. And that is the effect, in, uh, the effect of the 60. And again, the blood speckling uh, we see uh, just, uh, just like in uh, the 40 megahertz. And that's a bit the history of, uh, uh, of uh, the frequencies. And I can tell you, a uh, lot of frequencies are still available, 20 megahertz is still available and in the assist codama you can even choose between 40 only, 40 megahertz uh, and uh, or the, broad, uh, the broadband uh, 60. There is a switch on your machine that you say, well, I would like to have the 40 or I would like to have the 60 broadband. Which, which typically could be of interest in case of, for instance, uh, imaging uh, peripheral arteries or arteries that have a larger diameter, right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's right. correct. But Jürgen, in brief, so in conclusion, uh, clearly in the last 20, 30 years, a lot of improvements in IFAS technology, yeah. which uh, at least to my experience made the IFAS more accessible to uh, to people who not use it on a daily basis, but uh, still want to uh, want to get acquainted or get familiar yeah. with infravascular imaging. So uh, adjudicating the different times of plug dissections yeah. and all the things you might encounter really became, yeah, I would almost say easier with the uh, with the higher frequency technology. Um, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I agree partly actually because uh, with the lower frequency, uh, with the 40 megahertz, and even with the 20 megahertz, you find your way. Most uh, and definitely with 60, you have a help, and we're going to we're going to see that. But what is important, and that is whatever frequency you have, whatever system you have, if you have, uh, um, uh, is there, uh, you still have a learning curve with, uh, for, for uh, tissue characterization and the learning, and it's not only a learning curve, but you have to keep it up and you have to uh, make your own um, uh, database and archive and, and uh, review like that. And then you bring uh, your uh, knowledge of, of IVUS to, uh, uh, to a level that you feel absolutely confident in the room. All right, so maybe yeah. uh, let's quickly uh, switch to the basics. Um, yeah. What we want to do is briefly bring you up to speed in terms of basics of, uh, of plug characterization. We'll not uh, spend a lot of time on this, but just uh, for those who are new to the technology, uh, uh, we think it would be good to, uh, to have a very short intro of the different yeah. phenotypes of plug you might yeah. encounter. Yeah. Now in this case, uh, this is an example. We always start with a normal artery. A normal artery, um, you know, we have intima, media, and the adventitia. Well, the intima that is uh, that shows is dense. It uh, appears as a gray layer, and I say gray, and then I want to emphasize that's an, what I'm talking about a normal intima. The media that's made of homogeneous smooth muscle cells and is not reflected by ultrasound because ultrasound reflection, you need the difference what in what we call an acoustic impedance and media, the key word is homogeneous. So if uh, you have a homogeneous mass, then there will be no reflection of ultrasound, so, that, uh, so that's why it stays black. And the inner side, the leading edge of the adventitia, we can see behind the media, the outside of the adventitia yeah. is falling, uh, back, falling away uh, in the surroundings. And this is what you see with the a normal vessel. And I always advise, uh, take a good look at it, everyone. Hey, we're now with 57 people. You look at that and put this image on your backbone yeah. Yeah. Uh, that you recognize yeah. a normal vessel. So I've seen this, Jurgen so many times now. Yeah. And I've seen you explaining this and, and, and uh, presenting this myself on, on plenty of occasions. Yeah. But this indeed is crucial, specifically if you encounter some, some, some more abnormal things like, like bridging, spasm. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe even uh, spontaneous dissections, if you're not able to recognize what a normal artery is, even if the lumen looks comprised, yeah. 
you 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 miss the uh, the opportunity to learn a lot with Ivis, and yep. uh, this is uh, this is definitely key. Yeah. Well, and then we start with plugs, and um, uh, we put um, uh, three examples uh, uh, in still, and the same one in uh, movement. And actually, I call this always no lesson one of uh, plaque characterization. And it's very easy. And uh, what you see, if we look at the top one, you see the vessel, and um, the inside, we see, we, in the dead zone, we see the catheter in the middle of the lumen. Um, and if you look outside the vessel, then you see a density, a brightness. And uh, the first very easy thing to keep that in mind, and that is where you start, huh? and it's quite simplistic that we do that, um, the plaque that you see, for instance, uh, in, uh, in the top left one, it's darker than the surroundings, so you can consider that as lossy, fibro fatty plaque. It's darker than the surroundings. If we go to the middle part, then you see, again, outside the vessel, the density. Now you see plaque that is just as dense as the outside. Then we call it fibrous plaque. See, it's uh, brighter than uh, the fiber fatty one. It's just as bright as the surroundings. To the right, we see just as bright, but we see a shadow behind that. And that's calcium. Uh, calcium has this specific uh, shadow because uh, calcium has a very di big difference in acoustic impedance uh, uh, according to the, uh, to the rest of the material. So most of the, uh, most of the ultrasound signal will be reflect. That's why you have a hard, bright uh, spot on that. And, um, and what goes through it will find this wall of calcium on its way back and will be bounced back the other way. So that will not reach uh, the probe. So that's why you have this acoustic shadow uh, on calcium. So that's where you start. Fiber fatty, darker than the surroundings, fibers as bright as, and calcium as bright as, but with a shadow. If you start with that, if you put uh, that in uh, the beginning, then you have already a very good start uh, and starting recognizing things during your cases. Well, then in the wisdom, because um, yeah, that's a nice story. We had when we had the first uh, pictures from uh, Assist and the 60 megahertz uh, broadband, then we say, well, probably we need some extra uh, modes because we uh, saw it was quite grainy, it was not always suitable for all uh, for all cases, and so we discussed with uh, the company, and then uh, we came out with uh, three imaging uh, imaging modes. Uh, the classic view, and the classic view, that's the one that was there from the beginning, but then it was added to the lumen view and the silk view. And you see uh, already a bit the difference. And um, what we uh, uh, recommend and what we use uh, for cardiology now is the lumen view. First, actually, when I saw it first, a sil we thought it was a silk view, but uh, in practice, uh, the lumen view is for cardiology, at, uh, at least for our uh, from our perspective, for our perspective uh, we use the lumen view because there we see uh, we get the most out of it, uh, uh, the most information in the pictures. All right, so some basic principles when you start by using IVIS, uh, just a few basic things that, uh, that, that seem very obvious, but uh, we've seen that. I mean, we collect yeah. all the cases yeah. and uh, review uh, all of them. And you see these issues a lot. So if you want to use IVIS, take the time to, to get familiar with the software and prepare the yeah. catheter well. So that means you start with adequately flushing the catheter according to the, uh, to the IFU. We typically here do that in three steps over the, over the rail of the IVIS catheter. There are different ways to do it, but uh, you find your way and make sure you do it properly. Because otherwise, uh, you get images like, like the one shown here, in which uh, just at the, uh, the spot of interest, you lose the, uh, the image because of uh, air bubbles in the, uh, in the lumen of the catheter. Finally, disengage the guide. So if the, uh, if the guide is quite deep, uh, also that sounds quite intuitive, but yeah. it's, uh, it's not rarely uh, uh, missed. If you have osteo lesions that are missed because of the fact that the guiding is, is, is simply too deep in the ostium of the, uh, of the either left main or the ostium of the right. Finally, always image the first artery, specifically if you yeah. do uh, imaging for the first time. Uh, so in this case, for instance, there was a uh, right coronary artery with a tight calcified lesion that we, uh, we stented. Angiographically, an, uh, an excellent result. 
But uh, if you would have uh, adequately looked at your uh, your post PCI pullback, you would have seen that in the proximal part there was a, a tight calcified lesion uh, in the proximal part of the right that we missed on the on the angiogram alone. So that means you always should image the and uh, use the full length of the uh, of the of the IVIS pullback yeah. specifically during the the first pullback you do. Yeah, you paid for it. Eh? Yeah. You paid for it, as <laughs> yeah, Jurgen yeah, always yeah, mentions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's it's a pity. I mean, if yeah. you have a stand of two centimeter, it's very easy to just image the uh, the two centimeter, maybe three centimeter of the standard segment. But we uh, occasionally find uh, residual yeah. focal treatable disease uh, that was not readily apparent on the angio uh, on a pullback of ten centimeters. So uh, make use of that, and uh, you might get surprised on the additional information the IVIS uh, yeah. will uh, will get you. Final thing we want to measure before starting with the case is the basic principles and the uh, the sense and nonsense of the uh, of the assist system. So the uh, the assist uh, HDI system has uh, has two advantages. One, as mentioned and uh, explained by Jurgen, it has the uh, the HD uh, feature, meaning you have a broadband IVIS transducer with a 60 megahertz uh, frequency, which uh, specifically uh, helps to uh, to uh, increase the uh, the the um, image quality in the near field. But another interesting uh, feature is this, this catheter offers you to do a very fast pullback speed, namely uh, up to 10 millimeters per second, where most of the uh, competing uh, technologies offer 0.5 or 1 millimeter uh, per second. Um, that said, uh, that doesn't impair the image quality because no. that's what we were afraid that's of true. in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So typically with a, uh, a system of 0.5 millimeter per second, you get 60 frames per millimeter. But if you, uh, for instance, with a competing technology, go to one millimeter per second, you have 30 frames per millimeter. In this case, with the assist, we use now as a basic setting the 2.5 uh, millimeter per second, which still gives you 24 frames per millimeter, which is uh, absolutely sufficient to do uh, adequate procedure planning, sizing, and uh, adjudicate yeah. all the, uh, the, uh, the features you want to have. And with that, you uh, you can significantly decrease your uh, your procedure time with uh, actually five times because it goes five times as fast as a uh, individual pullback at uh, 0.5 millimeter. Yeah, but uh, just I want I want to add something. We put the 2.5 because um, it's uh, still faster and uh, still um, uh, not um, uh, so fast that you cannot follow it uh, live during your during your uh, pullback. Yep. But uh, for starters, uh, feel free to use the 0.5 or 1 millimeter per second uh, yep. if you want to follow your pullback uh, during the case and already uh, uh, have an orientation uh, for what you want to measure there. Yep. Uh, that's, uh, yep. uh, there's nothing wrong to do it with 0.5, but we choose 2.5. Yep. Uh, it worked fine. Yeah, yeah, that's a definitely yeah. a good point, Jurgen. So uh, yeah. always as compared to, uh, to OCT, IVIS is, uh, is obviously slower. The good thing is you don't need contrast, so you can do as many pullbacks exactly. as you like. And there, yeah. the uh, the faster pullback speed is definitely of interest. But the uh, the 0.5 specifically in the beginning gives you the time to really take the time to go through each of the frames exactly. uh, live during the uh, the pullback. The five and ten millimeters we rarely use, I have to admit, yeah. uh, because there yeah. we at least, to our opinion, you start you start uh, to lose some image uh, image yeah. quality. Yeah. All right, um, so with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll finish the introduction. Yeah. Um, we will focus now in a, uh, in, on a specific case in which we will uh, go through the uh, different types of plug and procedural planning. Are there questions so far? Yeah, so yeah. let's see if there are any questions uh, up to now. I don't see any in the, uh, in the chat box, but uh, please feel free to, uh, to interrupt us anytime with uh, any questions uh, you might have. So we'll start by presenting you the case. So this was a 67-year-old uh, female patient which uh, came to our institution, I think it was end of, uh, end of last week. Yeah. Uh, diabetic, smoker, uh, no obvious cardiovascular history, but some history of, of uh, spine surgeries due to a, some kind of osteomalignancy. She presented with a uh, infralateral STEMI, and uh, we want to show you how we did this case, IVID guided, uh, with all the uh, uh, tools and tips and tricks that we can, uh, we can show you. So this was her uh, coronary angiogram. You see the, uh, the metal material in the back, which uh, is somewhat interfering, but uh, not that much. So the right coronary artery looked nice and patent, very mild plug in the, uh, the mid-segment. So as... Uh, anticipated a uh, occlusion of the uh, proximal cirque, thrombotic lesion, and the LED looked, uh, looked fine. At least no focal disease. 
So we uh, actually started with the wire as you typically do in a STEMI. Uh, we recanalized the, uh, the, uh, the circumflex, actually we went quite fast, small puff of contrast uh, already showed us that we, uh, we, got some, uh, we got some flow but not that much. And then we started with, the, uh, with, an, with an IVIS pullback. Um, the reason, and that's just a little bit of background, is that uh, we included this patient in the, in the spectrum study, which is a uh, single center observational study. We uh, started in the Erasmus two months ago, uh, focused on tissue characterization mm -hmm. and uh, primary PCI guidance using HD IVIS in a series of uh, 200 STEMI patients. Um, with the objective to, uh, to assess clinical outcomes and optimization percentages. So how many of the cases are we yeah. really able to, uh, to yeah. optimize using IVIS and then how many of these cases will IVIS really change our, uh, our strategy? And we will focus on, uh, on thrombus burden, thrombus uh, quantification and on uh, characterizing plug and lesion morphology using HD IVIS in, yeah. uh, in patients with, uh, with STEMI. Yeah. So uh, if you might think, why all these pullbacks in this case? Well, this was the, uh, the rationale. Uh, we're at uh, full speed at the moment with the study. Uh, we have enrolled over 35 cases, so uh, we anticipate to, uh, to finalize enrollment by the end of the year. But um, that just has a little bit of background. So uh, let's uh, go back to the core of this meeting and uh, yeah. show you the first IVIS pullback. Uh, first, uh, the picture what you see here, that's the image uh, of a small film to, uh, uh, to show where your IVIS uh, starts. That, uh, I always advise that very strongly to do that because that is actually uh, the first part of co-registration that you can do uh, because you know where you start then the f and then you know also where the first, what the first uh, side branch is that you meet uh, on the, uh, with your pullback so that you always know how you st where you start, then you know always where you are. Well, Rakesh, if we can switch to the, uh, to the console, or to the simulator of the console, that's in here. Uh, this was the first uh, pullback, and um, uh, what you see on uh, the bottom is the longitudinal view. I come back on that a bit later, but first of all, I, we will uh, want to concentrate a bit on the cross-sectional view, what you see uh, in the middle. So I will enlarge the cross-sectional view and we let this run. What we see already distal here, you recognize immediately if we look at uh, the surroundings, uh, the bright surroundings, then we see already here some fibrous plaque. Uh, yeah, Joost is indicating that. Uh, so the, I, I'm not sure, can you see our mouse? Let me check here. No, well, we no. Can. No. no, that is uh, around five o'clock. Then you see from si from uh, twelve till till um, till six o'clock, we see the plaque, and you see that it is uh, almost as bright as surrounding. So this is more uh, the fibrous plaque what uh, we indicated. So we started with a pullback, and uh, we found a small side bends there, and we see here that the vessel looks more or less normal. Uh, there is some uh, plaque at. Um, at 11 o'clock, a bit uh, hidden by the wire there. You see the dark shadow at 12 o'clock, that is the guide wire. And we see a more or less normal uh, vessel. You can uh, uh, easily appreciate uh, the media there. And, if, and also what I want to show you, that is the dark speckling, and I let it uh, run, dark speckling of in the lumen. That is changing, if we look, put it in here, that uh, it's getting more bright in the lumen, and that is not pluck, but that is non-moving or slow-moving blood. And that you see here, if we stop the pullback now, then we do not see a pluck in here, but this brightness is a sign that the bloodstream uh, is slow, uh, has slowed down. There is no uh, stream and no moving blood. Uh, you can see as a sort of bright, you have a strong reflection of that. And actually, in echocardiography, you see it also, and there you call it spontaneous contrast. Yeah. So maybe if you go a bit more distal, Jürgen, and click play, people can, yeah. uh, can nicely appreciate yeah. the difference. Yeah, there we so go. Also here, here we have... You um, don't see the typical contrast speckling that yeah. you would and anticipate. And here you see already the turbulence. Yeah. You see? In yeah. there. Yeah, the spontaneous contrast. I let it run now, and we see uh, that... Um, after you go, we see at 12 o'clock, we saw the sidebands coming in. Here we see the slow flow, and the cause of that is, if we go more 
proximal. Then we see at 12 o'clock, we see what we call already organized Pause. thrombus. And we see a plug in here at, at, uh, at 10 o'clock, this mass, this black mass in the middle of the lumen. So that is what we call some organized thrombus. And organized thrombus that typically uh, uh, you see less reflection in there, that's quite dark. If we have more fresh thrombus, what we will also see right here, and now it's getting a bit difficult, uh, we see it around there. There is some fresh thrombus around. It's more, uh, more uh, gray, uh, more brighter gray. And we see al already here the problem. Uh, the problem is that the iris catheter is blocking the lumen because of this huge mass of thrombus, uh, what we see already in a narrowed vessel, because uh, we have attenuated plaque, um, fiber fatty plaque, all around. Uh, the picture gets a little bit difficult due to this, um, this uh, occlusion there with uh, some fibrous material, even some, maybe some uh, calcific material and also this thrombus. And the more material you have, uh, the more reflection you have, the more you, uh, the less you will see from the outside. Dif uh, depends also on the kind of plug. More proximal, and more proximal, we have a good lumen here. And then we see also side branch. And then if I let it run, we, see, we do not see this strong reflection. So there is more flow because there is more flow towards the side branches in here. And you see, proximally, we have here the uh, bifurcation with the LED. We reach the left main, and this is the IVUS catheter, which was uh, selective in the, uh, in the left main. So, All right. Yeah. Anything to add, Jürgen? Otherwise, I think... Uh, we'll no, that's uh, okay. So we have a def uh, definite stamy. Uh, we have yep. a lot of uh, pluck in this uh, young woman. And uh, yep. now, yeah, how to continue, Joost? Yeah, so um, again, please don't hesitate to use the, uh, the chat function in case you want to ask something. So again, a uh, very nice demonstration, I think, here of uh, slow flow, recognizing different types of thrombus and the uh, complexity of adjudicating uh, subtotal rupture plugs here with IVIS as, as yeah. seen here. Uh, so we continue, so we confirmed in this case, so the presence of thrombus and we, uh, we proceeded with, uh, with thrombectomy. So if you can go back to the angio, we uh, proceeded with a uh, thrombectomy catheter, which uh, didn't cross all the way actually and uh, did not result in a, uh, in a large or clearly visible uh, thrombo uh, aspirate. And then we repeated the IFIS, uh, mainly in the interest of the study to see if this uh, thrombectomy uh, improved our, uh, our flow and uh, whether the, uh, the underlying plug became uh, better visible. So we'll briefly go through uh, the second pullback. Yep. Perfect. Just to show you the, uh, the, the changes that uh, uh, were uh, introduced yeah. by, the, uh, by the thrombectomy. By the way, you were quite consistent in posi positioning this eye, as you see. Yeah, <laughs> no. also, yeah. of course, because of this patient was in the study, but I think at the end, yeah. um, with the 2.5, you can do these pullbacks within uh, 15 seconds. So yeah. there's no point in, uh, in, in aiming for very short pullbacks in which you might miss your uh, potential distal landing zone. Yeah. Now let's look at the IVIS. Uh, Rakesha, can you switch back to the, to the IVIS console? Yeah. Well, I let it run, and I think that you will uh, immediately see that, uh, or actually what you don't see, we do not see this strong reflection anymore. Yep. So that, that means that we have uh, definitely a better flow. It's not still not perfect, but it's better. It's not that very bright, uh, uh, bright uh, uh, reflection anymore and if we go more proximal then we see that uh, even there is still some uh, some thrombus visible that we created some room by removing part of the thrombus yeah. and that means uh, that there is more flow distal from this lesion we can also appreciate better now the the plaque in there so we yeah. see now the fibers uh, the fiber calcific plaque in there if we go more proximal, we can see also some, uh, uh, some fibro fatty plaque. And more proximal, uh, we can, and this is what we already saw in the proximal, 
circle flex. So definitely this, um, this thrombectomy did already uh, part of the job, so that is uh, a good base to continue with uh, the next step of the treatment. Yeah, yeah. so um, let's continue with the case. So there's one question from the audience related yeah. to the fact that the iris catheter itself might cause distal embolization. Um, well, yes, I mean, um, at the end, I, we know that in, in STEMI, all the manipulations yeah. you do uh, will uh, dislodge and disrupt the thrombus and, and cause, cause per se the distal embolization. Uh, but the same counts for, for aspiration from back to me. As you know, there's a lot of discussion as to whether or not that should still be pursued. Yeah, even um, guide wires. Um, yeah. yeah, the same counts for, for pre-dilatation versus direct stenting. Um, the reason for this study is that uh, we want to address at least some uh, part of the unknowns. Uh, for instance, uh, in which cases do we think that uh, aspiration from back to me would still make sense? Or is this something that based on IVs and what we see should completely be abandoned? Um, and then we, uh, we obviously also in this study will uh, keep track of all the uh, uh, cases with, which at the end, uh, at certain stages during the procedure end with a slow flow or, uh, or no flow. Um, so we continued here, uh, so we found a plug that was uh, at least fibrocalcific, so we took a uh, somewhat larger balloon in this relatively large vessel, so if we can go back to the, uh, to the IVIS, oh, to, the, uh, to the ANJO, we took a, a 3.5 uh, balloon, predilated the proximal part and uh, made a short ANJO, which uh, confirmed uh, decent flow and a clear improvement in the, uh, in the uh, patency of the artery. And here it becomes uh, becomes interesting because now this uh, the STEMI case uh, perhaps turns into a more routine case in which you use IVIS to uh, define your stenting strategy. Uh, we know we have a proximal circumflex lesion. Uh, we're not sure yet where this lesion starts and ends. We see a, a posterior lateral branch that, uh, let's say, takes off from a part of the circumflex that's really big. Uh, the proximal part is clearly diffusely diseased up until the ostium. But in this case, um, I think most of you would agree that uh, we would like to avoid uh, left main stenting here. So this is where the IVIS truly uh, has its value yeah. and uh, will definitely show you whether there's an opportunity to land in the osseal part of the circ or whether there's absolutely a need on to, uh, to go into the, uh, uh, in this case, short left main. Yeah. So Jürgen, maybe yeah. a pullback number three uh, after yeah, the pre-deal with uh, a 3.5 there. So. Uh, can you show it, Rakesh? Uh, yeah, that <coughs> is. Uh, so we see that uh, still, uh, even we have now even less turbulence in there. So the balloon also did its job. First thing is what we do, and I go a bit fast to uh, the part of interest. Uh, just um, uh, for your orientation, we see the side branch, this uh, uh, obtuse marginal branch, we see at uh, one o'clock. So we pass that, and we get here in our region of interest. So what I'm going to measure for you now, and uh, we still, by the way, we still see some thrombus rest in there. Yeah. And uh, what is always nice to see that you, you remove a lot with thrombectomy, but what is difficult to remove is the real organized thrombus. Yeah. Yeah, that is um, the, the stuff that always uh, stays. Well, actually, uh, I'm going to demonstrate you anyway. I'm going to measure for you a minimal luminal area. Actually, me, the minimal luminal area I just do it for the record for you guys uh, is the least interesting part what we have because what we uh, because we want to uh, because we already know that we want to treat this uh, but for your um, for the record it's uh, minimal luminal area and maybe it's still exaggerated a bit it's uh, maximum 2.8 square millimeters yeah. and that is something that uh, you don't want if you would put an FFR in this one would be definitely, uh, definitely uh, positive. But you maybe before proceeding with the yeah. measurement. So uh, what you expect here is that we disrupted the plug, that we yeah. created maybe even some dissections. Um, since we have the time, why don't you go back to the distal part and uh, put play? Because for yeah. us this is uh, quite intuitive, but yeah. I think uh, this is a complex plug, yeah. but also a very nice. Uh, demonstration of, of, of how we modify the disease and how we can recognize yeah. the different components. So yeah. here we start at the ostium of the posterior lateral branch. Yes, and, uh, we, and then we let it play. So we see some, um, some fiber fatty plug around. Still, we have a very good uh, lumen in there. And we already 
uh, think about from where our landing zone is. Uh, there is a big misunderstanding sometimes that you uh, need to do your landing zone always in a normal vessel. Well, our experience is that you can wait till kingdom come till you find a normal vessel sometimes in, in vessels or, or that you end up with full metal jackets, what you don't want. Um, so we're going to find then a good uh, lumen. We pass here uh, the, uh, the rest of organized thrombus. Here we still have the minimal luminal area. And now we are reaching in a part that we definitely want to treat and then we're going to find uh, a nice proximal landing zone in there. This you can always do during already your pullback when you see that live. It goes fast enough with 2.5 but if you do that with 0.5 or 1 then you have uh, definitely the time already to, uh, to uh, put your thoughts on that. Um, here we get uh, in the, uh, in the we passed the ostium of the uh, circumflex uh, with this uh, concentric fiber fatty plug and this is already the bifurcation with the LED and we get in the short left main that we want to avoid with the, with the stent. So I think it's time to make some... Yeah, so some a sizing. few questions. Yeah. Um, so we know we have a, a lesion that extends from the, let's say, bit more proximal to the posterior lateral branch yeah. up until the ostium of the yeah. cirque. So we measured the MLA just for the sake of demonstration. Yeah. So again, the system is uh, fully touch screen. So yeah. that makes that the uh, that, that drawing the, uh, the luminal borders is, uh, is, is, is actually quite easy and intuitive. Um, yeah, you see, even, even with uh, my fi fat even, fingers, <laughs> even with Jürgen's fingers on this yeah. uh, small uh, iPad, we can uh, we can easily yeah. do it. And even uh, it's it's also very easy to correct. So, for instance, Jürgen, if you yeah. can uh, demonstrate, yeah, this one a bit, you can you can put your here. finger on one of the individual uh, dots and then um, change and the. Yeah. Uh, and what is the nice, contours. and what you, and what is nice, what you get for free, and uh, thank you guys from Assist, you get for free. You have your um, your lumen area 10.2, but actually automatically it gives you the smallest and the largest diameter. So that helps you with defining uh, what stand size it is. Yeah. So yeah. <coughs> actually, to find that, you only have to draw uh, the area. Yeah. Uh, so no difficult things with drawing and what kind of line do I have. To, uh, have to do that. Yeah. So, uh, Joost, what I found here is already 3.7. Yeah. That is uh, the proximal part in there. Yeah. Now we're going backward. Now go. Now we go distal. And what I do, and um, I put my finger on the longitudinal view, and I move that to the right, and that brings the cross section to the distal portion and I'm going to find a nice landing zone. Well, we don't want to cross this uh, side branch here, yeah. so I suggest that we put it here. There is plaque there, but there is also a huge lumen and I'm going to measure that for you. So I take my finger again. There we have 3.7 and 4 yeah. uh, and 11.6. and. What you also see there, and I make it a little bit bigger here, that automatically the parts that we measured, that they put a bookmark in there. This is the, uh, the distal refer, uh, this, uh, the, at uh, the left you see a post of the distal landing zone, at the right you see a post of the proximal landing zone, in the middle you see the position where, where, where the cross section is right now there. So we have a diameter, 3.7, 4 maybe, but now you want to have a length. And now is the line coming in. You see here there is a, um, a length measurement possible, so I choose that one. And now I measure the length from the post, from the proximal landing zone towards the distal landing zone. And voila, there we have it, 28 millimeters. Yep. And so this is interesting because, um, yeah, you can see here distally that uh, the obviously this is this is not like OCT, so co-registration is, uh, is 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 not readily available uh, at the moment. But in our experience with IVIS, uh, what is key is that you you familiarize yourself with the position of the catheter within the angiogram. And we knew in this case that we started our pullback uh, just distal to the uh, to a large uh, obtuse marginal branch. Um, 
and we put the catheter actually in the optus marginal branch. So the first large side branch here is the is the posterior lateral, mm -hmm. and. Um, we know that we can just uh, land our stand in this case because that's what the iris confirmed, just one or two millimeters proximal to this uh, to this large side branch. So that is yeah co-registration number one you would say. And the second thing you would like to know is do I need to uh, or am I able to at least uh, put my stand up until the uh, ostium without needing to cover the left main? Yeah. And uh, we obviously looked at this case uh, up front, but if you can show the uh, bifurcation, Jürgen. Yeah. You see here the bifurcation with the left, uh, with the LED. LED is at uh, seven o'clock. Yep. Direction, uh, uh, yes. And then if we go if slowly we move distal, slowly distal, then we sh have here the ostium of the. Yep. And yep. And uh, if I go there, you see yeah. 10.2. Well, uh, my colleague doesn't allow that anymore, but normally I say you can uh, you can turn a lorry in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so this is yeah. uh, this is nicely patent, but at the end of what yeah. is important is that there is no uh, relevant plug. Uh, yeah. So what, what? So then the, the next question obviously uh, would be what is relevant plug? Yeah. Um, so at the end, what it is about is that you can uh, adjudicate whether or not you have a high likelihood of getting carina shift or a plug protrusion yeah. in this case in the left uh, left main. That's not what you want. So relevant plug is what we call at least a plug burden below uh, below 50%. Yeah. Uh, so Jürgen, maybe you can demonstrate yeah, uh, uh, how we can measure that. Yeah, that's uh, because then we make another measurement in this one. Obviously, at some point you do it by eyeballing, yeah. but in this case, I think it's nice that uh, uh, just to show you how you can uh, most of the time what you do is that. to find to find a uh, an acceptable lumen. Yeah, because that is what your patient needs, acceptable lumen, that is what... And, well, if I make a, um, um, a total vessel, and I have to correct it a little bit, I'm exaggerating a bit uh, in there, I can correct that. And now my fingers... Then you see, uh, then automatically you get the uh, calculation of a plaque burden, and yep. in this case it's less than 50%. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so you indeed, you, you trace the vessel a bit on the... On the large side, but that's okay. I mean, it's still it's it's still clearly below fifty percent, and uh, also uh, uh, visually, it doesn't it looks uh, looks yeah. relatively okay over a length of at least uh, at least two millimeters in the osteal part of the cirque. So with that, uh, we were quite confident uh, that we could land or stand here just at the ostium of the cirque. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is nice is that you can uh, in this case where you yeah. really need to be in between the two side branches without the uh, the uh, ability to, let's say, take a stand that is perhaps five millimeters longer because you don't simply have the, the, the particular size. Uh, we had a 29 stand in this case. Yeah. Uh, we either had a, a 22 of the brand we needed to use versus a 29. And uh, here we decided that the, uh, the 29 would do exactly. Yeah. And uh, that was with the use of the eye is quite, uh, quite reassuring. Uh, what diameter did you use for? We took a 4 yeah. so that's a good point. So yeah. uh, we typically uh, size on the uh, maximum luminal diameter. There's always a lot of discussion nowadays whether you should size on the uh, maximum lumen diameter, whether you should size on the proximal or distal lumen diameter, or whether you should size on the on the EEM. Um, Jürgen, your thoughts? Yeah, Maybe my thoughts. Uh, first of all, uh, the EEM for me is a no-go because um, uh, with EEM there is always remodeling, so you always exaggerate your the size of uh, uh, of your stand. So, like we demonstrate in here, we uh, do the uh, we take an acceptable lumen, and then uh, we round it up to above, and that makes sure that you have a good apposition against your acceptable lumen. There is one uh, even. Even if you uh, choose to do EM in here, uh, okay, but there is absolutely a no-go to choose the size of the stent at the spot of your minimal luminal area. Because yeah. then you go really wrong because there most of the time you have a huge yeah. positive remodeling that brings you and that uh, you get in trouble with your landing zones there yeah. because then you're exaggerated and you can uh, have uh, dissections and other complications uh, yeah. in there. Yeah, so I think the bottom line is, uh, is, is I mean, you need to, to pick a landing zone with yeah. as little plug as possible. Yeah. And uh, that is what we already and demonstrated here in the proximal part. Yeah. 
take uh, a section with uh, with at least the plug burden below 50%. That uh, yeah. that was also in, uh, for instance, in the ultimate trial, one of the yeah. uh, key predictors of, uh, of suboptimal stand implantation and subsequent yeah. stand failure. So if yeah. you land your stand in a area with a plug burden above 50%, the likelihood of uh, of target uh, uh, lesion revascularization uh, increases exponentially, yeah. and in cases where you have a uh, nice and and relatively healthy uh, landing zone uh, like here, yeah, the difference yeah. between the EEM and the maximal luminal diameter becomes minimal because mm -hmm. if you would have measured a, a EEM here, and maybe Jurgen, you can do yeah, yeah, sure. Just for the uh, for the sake of demonstration, we would measure probably a 4.2 or something uh, in that. A little uh, bit too. Something uh, in that now I will can I can a bit. Uh, but why don't you just take the uh, the length measurement tool? That's uh, how we typically do it. Also with. Uh, oh the oh the length measurement. Yeah. Ah yeah just from, just from, I will take uh, take one frame further. So we try to help Jurgen here by providing him with a yeah. mouse, but. Uh, yeah, but he's, he's, uh, yeah, he's so uh, used to this yeah, this, to this, this touch I'll, I'll take <laughs> Well, you see here. In this spot, we have 4.8. Uh, yeah. That is uh, EM to EM, and here even a bit more. But that is uh, take into consideration that uh, be careful for this uh, this remodeling in there. Yeah, uh, that is uh, uh, because. And um, what I also want to say is sometimes you will not find um, a plaque burden below 50. Uh, yep. But then go for the acceptable lumen for your patient. Uh, so don't uh, be uh, uh, like that. Now, yeah, mm. now I cannot do it or I have to like that. Uh, but go then for the lumen because sometimes you just do not find that. And then there is a lot of remodeling. There is a good lumen. So you will help your patient in there. So uh, 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 don't be uh, uh, too more Catholic than the Pope. You see that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and then the final remaining question is, should you stand uh, based on the distal diameter or uh, proximal diameter? In this case, it, it actually yeah. doesn't matter because no. the, there's, there are no relevant side branches in this proximal segment. So you can clearly see that the, uh, the distal diameters are uh, virtually identical yeah. to the proximal ones. Yeah. But in general, if you have a longer lesion, for instance, in the mid LED with a lot of side branches taking off and a lot of tapering, uh, we typically take the yeah. uh, the the distal uh, distal yeah. diameter and they use a uh, a non-compliant balloon to uh, to upsize the stand proximal. Yeah. Also depends obviously on the type of stand you have. Um, some uh, types of stands have large expansion limits; others uh, somewhat less. But that so uh, that that is that is I think always open for discussion. Yeah. But um, in principle, we typically use the. Uh, the distal yeah. uh, areas. Yeah. So we proceeded here. If we can go back to the uh, back to the Anjo with a uh, four point zero times twenty nine Firehawk stand. So the Firehawk is the uh, is the drug looting stand that we use within this uh, in the Spectrum study, and we post dilated with a four uh, zero non compliant balloon across the full segment, uh, and ended up with a, a very nice angiographic result. Timmy tree flow and uh, also ST segment resolution on the uh, on the EKG, yeah. um, and then finally, obviously, uh, the key benefit of IVIS is uh, in the fact that you can optimize your stand. So that means you can uh, look out for uh, optimal or suboptimal stand implantation, meaning uh, looking at expansion, edge dissections, and um, uh, malaposition. Uh, including the uh, the plug burden at the edges. So with that, we uh, we proceeded with a uh, with a final pullback. Yeah. I go back to that. Yes. Uh, so then make sure that you position your uh, probe distal from the stand. Yeah. 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 It's it's obvious, but sometimes we <laughs> we yeah. find this. Uh, this is indeed yeah. Uh, yeah. indeed <laughs> obvious. Uh, but, the good but, thing is that the uh, the nose of the uh, of the uh, of the Kodama yeah. catheter is very short. Yeah. In contrast to, for instance, the nose of an OCT catheter that is two to three times uh, as long. Yeah. So if you have uh, standard distal segments, uh, it sometimes is very cumbersome, for instance, to do a post-PCI OCT because you need the length of the nose of the OCT catheter to uh, to cross the full standard segment. Here with mm -hmm. IVIS, it's somewhat easier. Uh, but what we typically do, and I think that's uh, that's uh, maybe a nice uh, uh, tip to take home, is yeah. that we use the uh, the live imaging mode yeah. when engaging the artery. Yeah. 
So when you uh, engage the IVID catheter over the wire and you put the, uh, the imaging mode in live view, you can uh, live follow uh, the position of the, of the IVID catheter once you uh, uh, cross through the standard segment and can uh, ensure that you, uh, you position your catheter in an area that is adequate. Yeah. In this case, that was very easy, but uh, in cases where you already see uh, distal hematomas or edge dissections on the spot during your live imaging before starting the pullback, that could trigger you already to, uh, to put the probe more distal and uh, make sure you end in a, uh, or start the pullback, I should say, in a uh, healthy reference yeah. segment. In case you want to do additional stenting, you, uh, you cannot do all the measurements you want. Well, then we can start with the pullback. Uh here we can show this pullback what we have. Uh, Agakesh, can you uh, switch? Yeah, thank you. So this is the, yeah. So this is, uh, I'll go um, by hand here. We start distal. We have this uh, huge lumen uh, there. We passed the, we passed the side branch. And maybe just let it play here. Yeah, I let it play. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah, there it goes. It plays a bit more slowly than uh, when than uh, the acquisition uh, moment, and that is probably because the yeah this computer, this uh, tablet, this uh, there is our side branch, and there you see that the stent struts are just covering. Had this uh, this side branch. Now we're we'll, we're going to look for um, uh, for three things, three important things. A position is a stent. Uh, a post is touching everywhere the lumen wall eh, against the plaque. Uh, we look at uh, expansion. Uh, is a stent expanded enough? It can be touching the lumen wall, but then still be too small. Uh, maybe due to calcium, or maybe uh, due to insufficient. Uh, inflation uh, so that you can increase uh, the lumen in the stent and then we also look at the edges uh, do we see uh, edge sections that we have uh, to attend to those are the things that we're uh, looking uh, basically uh, to the stent and in what order you do is uh, that doesn't matter if you uh, look at them we have a specific order we look at uh, the mla in the stent uh, then we're going to, uh, and we uh, look on the fly already to the apposition, and then, and then we're also going to check the edges of the stent and just outside the edges if we see disruptions of uh, the plaque indicating, a, um, indicating an edge, edge section. So, uh, in the meantime, while it was running, probably you've seen that uh, almost everywhere the stent was uh, touching nicely uh, the wall. Um, uh, I found one spot, and probably that was a small side branch where uh, maybe there was some uh, um, uh, that you get an impression of some malposition, but of always you have that if you pass uh, side branches. Another uh, cause of malposition can be that you have a sort of cul de sac uh, because of an older plaque rupture in there. Yeah, and then to get that opposed, you need a pointy balloon, and that is uh, still not invented, also not by a cyst, and uh, that uh, uh, you have to accept. So far, I didn't see uh, malpositions of, uh, of uh, importance. So what we're going to do now is to find the smallest area in the stent, and I think I passed that already, and that is a bit going up and down in there. And uh, well, with the carpenter's eye, like we uh, see it here, I think this is a, the smallest uh, lumen in the stent. I'm going to measure that for you so that we have the MLA in the stent. Uh, by the way, uh, all our IVSs are in a database and are reported on, and that is, uh, that is what I do with my colleague uh, Kaag, and that is also afterwards. And, um, then we can check and we can uh, put it in our database uh, also to learn and to see if a patient comes back what, uh, what happens. And if we see discrepancies, we always contact Joost or one of his colleagues to, uh, to ask what was going on. So we have here now a 9.6 square millimeter minimal luminal area in the stent. And remember the first uh, minimal yeah. luminal area was even less than two, yeah. yes?
Mm. So that is um, that I think we can be happy of. Uh, so we also, uh, uh, well, we looked at the expansion. Uh, there is some calcification in there that um, uh, that you have a bit less expansion yeah. here, but I think this is not really an important part. Uh, so, and now we're going to check yeah, here we have indeed some malposition in, and uh, I have this part is moving. Yeah, um, there is one uh, helpful button, and that is this uh, uh, rapid uh, review. What happens then? We put uh, the ma the machine is going up and down for a couple of frames, so then you can have some um, uh, some movement there, and then you can appreciate the movement of the speckling and what you see here is your stand strut and this there is some room behind here probably this is one of the plaque ruptures that we couldn't appreciate when we had all this uh, uh, this um, uh, thrombus in there yep. yeah so here you can see some malposition of the stand in this uh, cul-de-sac of uh, this older plaque rupture in there uh, because it's quite small, I doubt if you ever get this opposed. Because you need a balloon that goes really l focal in this uh, position. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, that is a little bit uh, too much. Of course, I know people who try definitely uh, to try it and then get uh, problems mm -hmm. more in another uh, But this position. is more than six. This is, this is at least six millimeters. So uh, yeah, yeah, we, we know from these cases that... Yeah. Uh, these, these very short uh, segments of malaposition, obviously no. if you have this across the full full standard length that would be an issue, but here it's just over two, three millimeters. This has, has, has there's, there's no conclusive evidence today no. that this will ever uh, result in a, uh, in, in clinical issues. Now, in general, if you have a follow-up, this will be filled up and, and then sometimes yeah. you have to, to look for it where, where it was. So now let's go to the edges, so we have here one edge, and uh, here we have a partly uh, jailing of this, uh, this side branch, uh, but if we look at the edge and if we look at the plug, then I don't see any disruptions no. in this plug, so that means we have no edge section distal. No. So no edge sections and no plug more than 50%. And no plug more than 50%, and also approximately uh, there is no edge section. Uh, the uh, the stand struts are resting nicely against the plug, and with a minimum. We landed just at the ostium. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Look, see, there's the ostium, and uh, well, this is precision placement. Eh? Yeah. And then with a minimal. With the help of the ivus. Yeah, absolutely, eh? and that is, and then with a minimal luminal uh, area of yeah. 10.9, I think this yeah. uh, this uh, the, this will make the patient very happy. Yeah. I think so too. Um, so with this, uh, we want to uh, conclude this case. Uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, for those of you who think, well, pff, whoever would do this in the middle of the night? Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. we do. We, we do, do yeah. virtually yeah. routinely yeah. now. Yeah. And uh, partly because of a, of a study that is running, but also in routine practice, our, we have a very liberal use of IVIS. I would doubt that uh, that any of any one of you would have, uh, have managed with a uh, with eyeballing take a, a 4029 yeah. stent in this case. Um, and in terms of time, this full procedure with the IVIS uh, with a fast pullback speed uh, and dedicated staff took 34 minutes, seven minutes of fluid time, and 65 cc's of contrast. So I think this uh, this to most of you would definitely be uh, acceptable numbers and uh, should not withhold you from uh, from using IVIS. Obviously, uh, everything uh, is based on adequate training, and yeah. uh, with that, we really uh, urge you to, uh, to, yeah, let's say take uh, take the opportunity to follow these courses, uh, as this will provide uh, more opportunities in the in yeah. the near future, yeah. in which we will uh, also discuss in uh, more cases virtually, and uh, hopefully soon also in uh, in person after. Yeah. Uh, a more widespread distribution of all the, the vaccines that yeah. are uh, currently coming available. Yeah, and uh, we can promise you uh, that we already uh, said with uh, assist uh, if uh, we see you in person, if uh, so we ha you have something to look out for. Then we have, uh, we'll have several of these tablets and machines and we give you some cases and you can play uh, for yourself. And we're going to ask you questions uh, uh, about that. So we'll 
really let you work on the system and that you feel more confident uh, when you, uh, you get at home. Uh, actually, we always say, please try this at home. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think uh, that's a nice comment to, uh, yeah. to, end, uh, to end this webinar. We would like to thank you for yeah. your uh, uh, attention. Thank you for yeah. watching. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to meeting you virtually yeah. and, live, uh, and live again soon. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.